All right, what's up, everybody? Sorry about being a minute late. I apologize for that. Um, yeah, we had a good weekend. Um, hopefully, you did as well in ProQuest season. Obviously, that kicked off. I uh, hope everybody had an amazing time at um, their event or in Atlanta if you went to that. Either one. Uh, so, we got some stuff we got to talk about, right? We got to talk about how, obviously, Dromai is gone, right? Um, which is a pretty big deal, meta-wise. We also have to um, kind of discuss, you know, possible dark horses that are going to break out in week two. Uh, we are going to talk, do a, a small recap on um the weekend because it was a little bit of a roller coaster to say the least um so we're going to do that i guess we can go ahead and start with just a recap of the weekend um for those of you who don't know um i played victor at the um at the battle harden uh unfortunately unfortunately but um no I, I thought it was an okay pick uh something that kind of threw me off was i did not expect that much kano in the room uh like at all that was a total shock i knew there would be some i planned for that but it was like the fourth or fifth most represented deck i did not expect that i ran to into two of them during my eight rounds in the battle harden and I lost one of them, won one of them. And yeah, and then I lost a match against Brody uh, where he dominated two fatigue shots. And I just couldn't, couldn't gain any momentum in the game. It was just dominate after dominate with, with uh, no D reacts in the deck. So yeah, we went six and two on the battle hard and getting like 14th, if I'm not mistaken. And then. Um, we went to the PTI event and, uh, I have to, before I get into the PTI event, I have to tell a little story. It's not a long story, but after you have a disappointing kind of performance at any tournament, you kind of go through this, this phase of where you sit around the buddies and talk about what went wrong, stuff like that. I had two people. Tell me something. The first one was Guy. Okay. Guy walked up to me and, and, and or I walked up to Guy technically. And I was like, man, Victor's just bad. Like, just a bad deck to be playing right now. And he goes, I'm so happy you told me that because I was about to just come up to you and say, we have to have a conversation. I was going to let you know. And I was, <laughs> I was like, I appreciate that, Guy. Um, but, you know, I, I beat him to the punch, basically. Uh, he, he's, he was like, I'm, I'm glad you realized that because, uh, yeah, that, that is the case. And it is true. Six out of eight of my matches that I played during the Battle Harden, I had no hero text. I played two Kanos. You can't clash against Kano. I played three Dromai's. It's very difficult to clash against Dromai if they play it correctly. There was only two matches where I resolved any clashes. And if you're not resolving clashes, you can't resolve Golden Sun, or you can resolve Golden Sun, but it's a shitty card if you don't have gold. So, yeah. It, 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 I would have much, I would have been way better off just playing Bravo. Basically, uh, some of that is kind of gym luck, but it just it's great against the warrior. Sure. And you can draw cards every time because they don't have any attacks. But basically, I played one warrior in the Azurion stream, and those are the only matches I had a hero ability. It was not good. It was not good. We managed to pull out a 6-2, but, you know, it is what it is. So the second person 
that walked up to me and said something. And if I'm being 100% honest, it is the reason I played Viscera on Sunday. Taylor Crawford walked up to me. And he said, bro, Kano's out here killing people in turn two. Katsu's doing 35 damage turn. Prism is looping ALS on people. Azalea is dominating for 15 and time walking people. And you want to throw three card eights. I said, I'm never playing Guardian again. I said, I'm never playing him again. Like, it just makes sense. Um, so let me get caught up in chat. Yep, Viscera. I'm so Viscera's best rogue deck for week two. We're going to get into that on what I think exactly is a good pick. Uh, I do agree, but we have to talk about which kind of Viscera. Uh, you played two PQs, was a lot of fun. It's my favorite type of event. RTNs and ProQuest, they're my favorite fab events of all time. Uh, just the local guys, you know, just hanging out. Everybody's just chill, but still competing. Like, it, it's a lot of fun. You went six and two and was disappointed in yourself. That is correct. Uh, seems you did good with the gym hand you were dealt. That it? Yes, but... At the same time, I'm the one that signed up to play a deck that had a 10% win rate matchup, right? And whereas if I brought any other deck, that maybe would not be the case, right? And uh, so, yes, it was bad luck with Jim, but it was also, like, if I played Viscera that day, I could run into Kano. I can, I can hold my weight against Kano, right? Um, I still had to play in Azalea. I still probably lose that one, but the Dromai's are, are an okay match. I, I think this is better into Dromai than, than, uh, than Victor is. Um, so, yes, I got bad gym luck, but at the same time, I kind of asked for it by registering a hero that has just an auto-loss quote-unquote matchup. Uh, I heard you find Victor boring. Is that why you think he's bad? No, it's not. He is boring. I think that he's boring. I think that he does not do something that is unfair enough. And there are other decks in the format that simply do unfair things. And it's as simple as that. Um, the examples I gave, Katsu doing 35 damage in a turn. You have Azalea. You have you know Kano, Prism. There's just a lot of decks that do a lot of unfair things. And also, there's a couple decks that I think get a huge payoff by Dromai leaving. And Victor's not good into them. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later, too. Um, but I, I'm just not happy with that deck. Uh, I just don't think, and I don't think the new card will change. I think the new card is phenomenal. But I don't think it changes. When that new card come out, comes out new's gonna come out and she's gonna be playing Terra Sunder Macho Grande for for no cost right um I do think he's unfair but it's matchup dependent uh Katsu somehow looks like joking I mean you say that but I've played against some really good Katsus and it's not as free as you would think if they know if the Katsu player does not know how to work that matchup you have a 100% win rate into them. However, that quickly goes to like 60%, maybe even 55 if they're really, really, really good. Um, like literally every turn, they should just be blocking, and if they have an extra card, Kadachi, and try to do all their damage in one turn, drop you to 10, and clean you up with Kadachis, basically, uh, is the idea of how they should theoretically be playing it if they're not doing that if they're trying to like take damage and send like a an average surging line or something like that and not go all in when they have like the combo then they're not playing it correctly um so because of what taylor said i was like i'm gonna play viscerai and so we're eating dinner with like the card guys and taylor's crew 
And Aaron, the the Visra player that I played in top eight against, looked at me and he said, should I play Visra tomorrow? And he goes, I, I was like, I am. <laughs> you should too. And it was just really funny that we both ran into each other at um, at the first top eight game. I wish it didn't come down to that. Um, so, Pankaj, you actually bring up a very good point, and it's actually a point that was told to me three times this past weekend, and I'll cover it now. So, a lot of people were like, bro, you've been playing Hatchet. I mean, Pankaj, how many times did I ask you for Hatchet Icelander games, right? Like, I've been on Hatchet Dorinthia for a year and a half. It was the second stream I ever did. If you go back, go to the Card Guys YouTube channel, hit the live button, and scroll all the way down till you stop seeing my face. And the second stream I ever did almost a year and a half ago was Hatchet Story. And when the new set came out, it's what I played against Team Blue Pitch in our show match. Um, I've been playing the deck a long time, very familiar with it. And Ponkage asked, why are you not playing the deck that is finally good when you have a lot of experience on it? And the answer to that question is, it's <laughs> the run through in Hatchet's door. That was actually hilarious. Um, it was one of the first test games that I played with it. And it was like right after I built the deck. He goes, uh, I, I, I was like, Hatchet for two? run through and he goes you can't do that i was like what do you mean <laughs> i didn't know that it said sword but you know that was uh that was hilarious but we uh we got we got over that hump um but yeah so the reason that i'm not on that deck is i think that there's a glaring weakness to the deck um i don't know if obviously due to its win percentages not everybody knows what that weakness is and I hate that type, that like grindy mid-range mirror match. It's the most boring thing ever. I do not enjoy it. I, the reason I fell in love with Hatchet Story was like I built it for the Phi matchup was the whole reason I got onto it. Because like they're trying to slam into you. You're like mitigating, taking windows you know, resetting your counter. But, like, when when everybody and their mama is doing it, like, it's just really boring. Like, everybody's trying to do the same thing, and it's just not an enjoyable experience. For me personally. Some people probably love it. Uh, but me, it just doesn't, it just doesn't do it. Um, give me the weakness right now. So, Spill the tea. Show us the secret text. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, it, a lot of it comes down to... A lot... Okay. If you're ever in a match against Hatchet Dorinthia and they triple swing... Twice, maybe three times you lose the game uh, because they accrue so much value off of that. The way that you beat the deck is by one, not engaging with it. Okay, what do I mean by not engaging with it? Explain to me the value that they get off of dynamos if you do not attack them with physical damage, right? And I... I of course, not everybody has that ability. I perfectly understand that. But you can also look at the break point of which you are presenting damage, right? So, as an example, right? We'll, we'll use Viscera, but we'll use some more mainstream applicable scenarios, right? You can make a rune chant and swing Reaping Blade and then block out your... And for damage, Axe's Dorinthia has a very hard time utilizing every single card in their hand. So they're going to block that Reaping Blade. And Dynamos is going to sit there. They don't get any value from it. You get their Tunic Counter for the, for the Rune Chant, 
which is value, or you don't, and you leak damage, right? And the same thing go if you ever try to attack the deck on the same axis of which it's trying to, you will always lose the game. That's why there's way more blocking in the mirror because you don't want to engage in that type of gameplay as much, right? And so what, what can you do if you don't have access to rune chance? Well, the answer to that is don't play the mid-range game plan, right? Let's say you have the option to either block three damage and send four or send seven. Like that's your two options given your, given your hand, right? You block six, send seven, or block nine, send four. I'm just using just a broad example. You always want to choose the lower value because there's a very high chance that the way the decks are built now, they're going to have to basically... You don't get punished when you forfeit tempo. It's not a deck that can really capitalize that on, unless they have like spill blood. That's the only exception. But that's why you put DBX in Arsenal and you wait for those moments or you wait for those reactions. Uh, kind of reminds me of the discussion of how to beat Victor. I exactly. It is very, very similar. And yeah, just block, play, read the runes. That is actually how you beat it. <laughs> and that's why Vistra is really good into that. Um, but I'm trying to give some more examples of like how, like, let's say you're playing KO and you're having a hard time against the deck. Block out. When you get a big turn, play your turn. Don't do small turn and small turn and small turn. And then, oh, you accidentally got a big turn. I guess we take it now. They're going to work your life total down and get you to start blocking quickly. It's all about. It's kind of like treat it like a fatigue match is really the best advice that I can I can give. Um wait for big turns. Don't try to mid-range at all, or you're just gonna play the exact game that they're planning on. Now I will preface this with Drow My leaving the format. There's a very good chance that those decks lean a lot more aggressive. So maybe the fates come out. Uh sigils could come out maybe i think it's a very good card uh but depending on what the meta kind of dictates maybe some like stroke of foresights go in or something like that to get um we're just talking about uh hatchets during the dm uh kind of like how to beat it uh and so if they do start adding those additions then what i just said becomes extremely invalid because one, they're going to be able to use all their cards on offense, right? Which means giving up tempo is really, really bad, right? Uh, and you're not going to be able to block and prevent the third swing. So you're going to get destroyed with that strategy. What I just said only applies to if they are staying on the sync, fate, sigil, uh, some even run, run remembrance and heart and, and like, you know, a very like defensive mid range oriented hatchet stack. If they go more aggressive, that plan does not work. Uh, in fact, going forward, I think that's the way to play it, me personally. Um, that's what I would do. I would try to make it more aggressive, not defensive. Um, so let's. Did I miss anything else? Uh, let me go through chat, make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get into the, the discussion of, we'll talk about the ProQuest the first week real quick. Um, and I guess if, if, if anybody was wondering, uh, for Viscerai, my matchup spread was I played two KOs, a Dromai, an Azuri, an Azalea, and a Katsu. I think that's seven. And then you guys saw the top eight. Um, 
But congratulations to to Cass. Just killed it. Just killed it. Absolutely. Uh, Blood Rush Bell is a hell of a card, but he played it phenomenally. Uh, stopping that flip right there, uh, or st stopping me from preventing him to flip so he could actually get the flip off was, was really, really well played. Uh, 100%. It's your last stream, but watch the VOD. I definitely wound up same page regarding using variants to cope with skill differences. Appreciate the idea. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, are you on Tunic for KO? Oh, you meant Runic. Uh, runic Rec. Um, I think Runic Rec is good. I had one in my list, and I did put it in against KO the reason obviously you can blow up the um the agility token it is a break point and it is a two for seven at worst um however i really would not push it unless they had an agility token i'm not going to take a whole bunch of damage to try and snipe a might token basically so you do have to be when I first started playing that card, I noticed it made me really greedy at times, which is not something that I like. Uh, I don't like my cards to dictate my play. Um, that's just a, a personal preference of mine. And so just be careful of that. Um, they do have a lot of armor. Because like I would rather keep my life total higher and wait for a Revel in Runeblood to where it's just going to do more damage no matter what their hand is, right? Um, I think that's the important thing with Viserai in that matchup specifically is keeping your life total high enough to where you don't have to block when you get the hand, right? Uh, so let's talk about ProQuest season, week one for a second. Dromai's out the door. We have her winning the absolute most, right? Uh, very, very good. I mean, I think everybody saw that coming. Uh, anybody that had played her has the deck. Basically, probably took her for one last spin. Uh, I think I played two people at the calling that they told me that exact thing. They were like, just here to take her on one last spin. And I was like, okay, cool. So, starting Friday, I believe, right? Uh, she will be gone. And then we can look at the rest of this, right? The one thing that really shocked me on this. Ao, of course, didn't shock anybody. Dorinthia didn't shock anybody. Prism. I was not expecting people to ad adopt Prism this quickly. I knew it would happen, but I did not think that it would happen this quickly. Uh, it was, that was a little bit of a shock to me. Uh, I know she's good. I know she's really good. And I knew people would pick her up. I just didn't think it would happen this fast. So a little bit of a shock there. Victor, I'm not surprised. Uh, Azalea's good. Katsu's good. And then so forth. Uh, Kano had a very slow start, which is very, very kind of, you know, very contradictory toward um, toward last season, during the, the, uh, the RTN season. So this is the top eight of the uh, the battle harden in Atlanta. Uh, of course, we saw Dromai take that down. Congrats to Jeremy, uh, Atlanta local, really cool guy, and definitely deserves it 100. percent And then we had, I don't know what country this is. Somebody's gonna have to to, to educate me in chat. Uh, but a lot of Dorinthia, I don't think is super surprising. I'm surprised at that at that many Victor and Vincent. Uh, yeah, I don't even know who won this. I don't know what hero won this event. I don't know if it'll actually tell me. Da, da, da. Guess if we go here. I guess one way that we can go to find out, uh, Poland. Okay, thank you. So we can see who actually won that event. And first place was Dorinthia. Okay, and then it, so it was, a, it was a Dorinthia versus Azalea in the uh, finals. Okay. 
that seems pretty logical. Uh, I, I, if I had to guess, the Vincent probably got knocked out by what by the victor, uh, because Vincent should theoretically be very good into Dromai and then very, um, very good into Warrior as well, depending. Uh, so yeah. As far as what I expect going forward uh, in weeks two, week three, and then week four is the first shift that I expect to see is Kasai will start taking up a lot more real estate and actually start taking away from Dorinthia. Now, chat, I know you're about to get me. And you're about to say, well, two weeks ago, you said there was no reason to play Kasai. And you're right. And I was right. <laughs> but as Dromai leaves the meta, right, Dorinthia's third swing hero ability is very impactful against Dromai, right? Because it, you can either kill more dragons or finally push damage towards Dromai, apply a little bit of pressure, and so on. Whereas Kasai was just like, the hero power does nothing. I don't even think you get the gold. You have to hit a hero, right? Like, it's literally awful. So, the negative reason not to play Kasai is now gone, right? And then one of the positive reasons to play Dorinthia is gone. Now, what is Kasai better into? Well, Kasai is better into any deck where you can resolve raise an army and raise it uh, or play the card effectively, right? And so I'm really expecting a lot more Kasai to come up and kind of steal the market share from Dorinthia. And that's solely because Kasai is much better at avoiding fatigue, still has the positive matchups into KO, uh, but handles the Guardian matchup a lot better, probably handles the Azalea matchup a lot better, and they both still lose to Kano, right? So that's what I'm really expecting. Uh, I expect Prism to keep rising. Uh, there's a lot of decks that just don't do well into her. Uh, but more importantly, I think Prism's going to see a lot of early success that will teeter off quickly. Uh, so what I'm expecting is over week two and week three, she do very, very well. And then people will start teching for her. Um, and what do I mean by teching? I mean like time skippers, you know, guardian double hammer, time skipper, whatever, you know, just any way, you know, Azalea players run, running Merc Meyer and just whatever ways they can improve that matchup is I think we'll start seeing that about week four. People are going to have to get slapped around once or twice uh, during week two and week three. But I think where Prism lands on you know the performance side of things in week four will be the, the better kind of will kind of speak to how good she is on, on how well she does during week four. Um, no, time skippers is not the answer, but time skippers against in a 70% prism is very effective, right? And at your pro quest, that's mostly what you're going to be seeing. Um, unless Rhea just depends on, uh, you know, I don't know if she's going to a hundred of them or not, but uh, yes, against a top, top tier Prism player, Time Skippers is not going, it helps, but it's not as much as you would think. It's not like you break out of the loop and you're free. Um, you, you are, there's still a lot of ways that they can win that match. Um, but against any Prism player that's like 70%, it, it, a lot of the times it's going to be more than enough. Um, and I'm not even saying that's the solution for every deck because you still need things to do with the action point, right? Uh, so really just depends. You have to be able to break. You have to kill the arc light and then kill air addition. That is like what you were trying. 
if you're worried about, if you're playing a deck that's worried about the loop, that's your goal in your deck building. You want to break it, which requires you getting an action point somewhere and killing air addition. Because if you just killed the ALS and you don't kill air addition, they're going to get to the second one and you're not going to be in a good spot. So, um, Katsu with AB3 is a, is a really good matchup for Katsu into Kano. Uh, or that's, what, that's what Majin's told me. So I'll take his word for it. Um, also, Dishonor kind of sucks if you get hit with it and you have no armor to stop it. So I'm expecting Prism to have a really good two weeks and kind of teeter out a little bit. That's prediction one. I'm expecting a lot more Kasai uh, to kind of start eating up into um, Dory's kind of share. I expect Victor to show up less and less by the week if everybody's starting to realize what I'm realizing. I think Azalea will only increase. Um, I don't think Dromai was a particularly bad matchup. For Azalea, it was probably like close to 50-50. Played at a really strong level when the Droma is more aggressive. Azalea might even be better uh, slightly. But I think that that's a matchup where the Azalea players just are not comfortable. They don't feel okay. They're fine, but they don't feel okay. And I think at a ProQuest level competition, it's very important to feel okay in a matchup uh, because sometimes you'll just psych yourself out and kind of like let it get in the way. And so I'm expecting once Stromai leaves, I think the Azalea players or people might just be more comfortable bringing Azalea. Might not be so much you psyched out in the matchup. Maybe you're psyched out from um, bringing it, basically. Um, Katsu, I'm expecting the inverse of Prism. I'm expecting a dip in the near short term over the next two weeks with an increase in the final week. Um, Kano. I think Kano's about to take off uh, once again until he starts running into Prism and then quits. Um, so I think that probably along the same lines as it really depends on the Prism. Uh, that matchup is, is really hopeless for, for Kano. Um, and so I, I think that I can't accurately predict what Kano's going to do. I think there's some people that'll play it no matter what. I do think that you lost a lot of the edge. I think it's a very strong deck, but if enough people bring Prism, it could push him out. Simple as that. Um, Leviah, I still think that she's an amazing hero and a good deck, but there's some variants and takes a lot of skill to play it. So nothing's changed there. Reinar, nothing to be really set. I think Bolton gets a lot better with Dromai leaving, of course. Uh, so does Dash, but for different reasons. And, of course, Azuri. I don't think Azuri is kind of surprising anybody. One thing that I want to point out, I know a lot of people that like to make their deck selection off of like Tower Shard data, right? And I want to, let me switch this real quick. Go to meta results, switch back over. So one thing that I want to explain real quick, I want to help people avoid going into a trap real quick. Because what can happen is you basically, you like to look at the Tower Shard data and say, I don't know why this is not loaded. Look at that. Okay, there it goes. It was just spinning. Okay. So you like to look at the data and say, okay, this is a bad matchup, yada, yada, yada. However, with Dromai leaving the format, it is so, so important to remember. Let's use Azuri into, uh, I don't know, Azuri into Phi as an example, right? So currently, 
Azuri into five is a. Where is Azuri? Where are you at, Azuri? There you are. Boom. It is a 37% favorite or underdog for five. Okay. Let's use the example. You ha- when you're looking at this data for the next couple weeks, you have to say half of the data, right? Because Dromai has been a legal hero for half of the month almost, right? What you have to keep in mind is the decks will change, right? Which is going to make this data very bad for a pro- until the month of May. The reason for that is, let's look at Azuri as a deck, right? While Dromai was in the format, they had to run a lot of cards like Hurl and E-Strike and stuff like that to really have a couple go-again options to beat the deck, right? But now that Dromai is gone, they get to not run that stuff and run different cards. And it might affect different matchups. Maybe it's more shreds. That makes them better into like the defensive decks like Guardian. Makes that matchup even better. Whatever the case may be. Right? And so you have to keep those when you're looking at this data specifically, think, okay, X hero, right? Dromai leaves. How did that change that hero? And how does it factor into the data? Because if they have a heavy sideboard plan or something like that into Dromai, the data won't be accurate. It just will not be. So just keep that in mind when you're using this data for the next 15 days. Because there's a very, very good chance that for a lot of decks, it's not going to be accurate. So, what is the last... Okay, so let's talk about just the meta in general, not necessarily ProQuest. um, ProQuest kind of week-to-week predictions or anything like that. Let's just talk about general strategies on what I expect over the next three weeks, and then we'll hop into some Viscerai game. Uh, so what I'm expecting this next week is, uh, let's see. So how did it feel to take Vis that far? It felt amazing. Um, playing Runeblade again, I felt like I was in my natural habitat almost, and I was just having a good time. Wasn't about the performance, just it it had been a minute since I'd thoroughly enjoyed playing a competitive flesh and blood event. Um just I don't know, something about it. Also, all my opponents were just amazing. That always helps. Uh, there was a lot of banter over the weekend. Absolutely loved it. Uh, I thought it was interesting that Ethan did the the hot mics for the top eight or whatever, and I, I had a blast listening to that. Uh, we were we were just cracking up, and I I hope that didn't annoy people or anything like that. I hope um, people just saw how genuine it was and and how you know we got we got a pretty solid community that enjoys playing great games. Simple as that. Uh, how does Missouri beat Fi like that? Uh, I don't know exactly. I mean. She's disruptive, right? And Fi doesn't like being disruptive would be my best guess. Um, the Cheerios Azalea feels like it has five intellect whenever they have. That's because it does. Uh, anytime you can tunic counter out a zero cost, it does have an extra intellect. Um, but to, to be honest, woo, Viscera. <laughs> um... But yeah, so I think that Azalea has the potential to be the most unfair deck in the format. Um, I, I'm not going to go as far to say that she needs a ban. I just think that... I don't think the devs love the word dominate as a mechanic in the game, which is why they made Overpower. And I think that Azalea uses Dominate more than, or in the most aggressive manner than any other hero in the game. 
And um, yeah, I, I, I think that it kind of leaves a lot of players just feeling hopeless um, in certain matchups. I, I know it does me even. Uh, even when I know how to play it and there's nothing I can do about it, because unmovable in armor only goes so high, right? You can't, when they throw dominate 15 time walk, like there's literally nothing you can do with any deck. Um, and yeah, that just is, is what it is. So, uh, love the hot mics. Thought it was really good to hear you guys back and forth on top. That's good. That's good. Uh, the whole point of Brony's list is randomly hit dominates and get death dealer value. That that's one hundred percent accurate. As dash, it's so brutal. You know, yep, you just you just feel helpless. Simple as that. Simple as that. So basically, for let's talk about week two of ProQuest. What I expect. Um, in, anybody in your local area, because ProQuests are. Oh, I'm, I mean, I know you're referring. No, I know you're referring to uh, to Prism, and I think Prism also does some very unfair things. Um, but basically, for week two, as far as like trying to predict your local meta, you know the people much better than I than I do, and you can probably predict it better. I'm just going to try and tell you that if there was anybody that was held down, like you had a guy that just loved playing Tech Lavosin, but knew was a good enough player to know he couldn't do it and be competitive, and now Joe Mai's gone. Chances are he's probably bringing Tech Lavosin this weekend, right? I'm expecting a lot of fatigue strategies to take off in week two uh, because there's a lot less ways to punish, right? Uh, you have Prism's good at punishing fatigue. You have Kano, of course. Uh, but there's like a lot of, there's not a whole lot of popular choices that really, really punish fatigue style strats. Um, IO doesn't even play tuning. Yeah, that's correct. Or at least the ones that. That I'm aware of. Uh, does it play random later? Yeah, I bet. Yeah, for a resource, you get an extra intellect. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I expect fatigue strategies to come out because, once again, Dromai is not there to, to punish. And then also, I think Warriors get even more comfortable in their seating in the metagame. And I'm expecting, like, I would not be surprised if there were a lot of pro quests where half the event was Warriors. Um, not because I particularly think it's the best deck selection, but it's, it's the combination of it's an easy deck to play. It does something that's, like, fundamentally powerful. And it's, quote-unquote, hardest matchup is, is no longer there and it still picks on ko right i think that's the important part right it still picks on ko um so what are your thoughts on specialist pilots aka or i.e pet decks um i'm gonna say something that a lot of people are probably gonna disagree with me on and i think that as the game of flesh and blood has progressed, being a specialist is becoming less and less value every single less and less valuable every single day. And here's my thought process on it, right? I'm talking for any meta. I'm just talking about the direction of the game, the, the direction that the game is going, right? Let's say you are like just the Riptide guy. I don't know who that is. Or, or you're the Arachne guy, right? Like you got all these reps with Arachne, right? We know that like even the best Arachne on the planet is only 
maybe like 80% competitive compared to other decks, right? Although they have made some top eights here and there, right? But one day, one day, they're going to print a collection of cards. It could be this very next set. Maybe there's some, I don't want to say generic, but like just regular assassin cards that Arachne can use, and it pushes them over the edge, just like the outsider situation with Azalea, right? And then Arachne has a six-month window where he is phenomenal, right? And you're going to have a good six months, and then the hero is going to LL, right? Or a year, or what, you, you see what I'm saying? And the question is, the time that you invested, right? Let's, let's use Josh as an example. I think Josh is a great example, right? He's the warrior specialist. How many years did he have to put into the class to render X result, right? Whereas if I think if Josh would like stay fluid and play a lot of other heroes, I think like overall he might have a better performance because it's been a long time since warrior has been relevant however given the situation right now the next year is looking amazing for josh because warrior is really good but the past couple years has not been so hot right and he's kind of had to pay that tuition to get to that point so i think the time that you have to invest to become a specialist does not outweigh the longevity of the hero for how long it'll be relevant. Uh, and I just don't think, um, I, I, I don't think, uh, yeah, but the second the class is on the up, he is, re yeah, but do you only want to be rewarded for one out of every four years? Is, is that what the goal is as a player? is to say, I'm going to sacrifice three years to have one good year. Is that what we're... Yeah, Le Lexi is a great example, right? Lexi is a great example. Uh, you know, you can have all that experience all you want, and then she's going to have her day in the sun. You're going to win some stuff. You're going to top eight some stuff. Like, congratulations. But then one day that will come to an end, and then what will you do? And I know you're going to say, oh, well, there's other, th there's other heroes in that class, right? Like you could, you could transition all your Dorinthia knowledge to Bolton, right? Now, Josh knows both, but I'm just using an example of somebody that only knows Dorinthia. Well, I hate to break this to you, but there is so little translation bet between Dorinthia and Bolton. It is so minuscule, I promise you. Very little carries over. Uh, it's just how it is. Um, well, so it is true, and it isn't true for all heroes. And I'll give you an example of why. Let's say somebody just plays Warrior their whole time. Did they ever get a chance to get an in-depth look at another class? No. But if you have somebody that played a little bit of Ranger, played a little bit of Runeblade, played a little bit of Guardian, played a little bit of Wizard, then whatever class that they hop to next, they have a better idea of what they're playing against. So the time that they spent with that class, there is value extracted. There is value extracted because you've played that class before. You know the lines. You know what to expect, right? And there is value there. Whereas if you invest everything in one hero or one class and it drops off, you got nothing to show for it. Uh, simple as that. Let me get caught up in chat. Uh, this is more on generalist versus specialist approach. Absolutely. Uh, I like what you're saying. 
you have no disagreements, which is hoping to pick your brain matter. Yeah. Uh, I think being a specialist is different to being focused on a few classes, like three or four. You can still be good at many things, but gain the special advantage more than generalists. I mean, yeah, but like I, if you're playing four classes, I don't consider you a specialist. Um, me personally, I, I don't. What percentage of specialists do you think are that way for economical reasons of not wanting to buy into another class? Well, that's something completely different, right? Like if it's a financial restriction, then it doesn't matter. Then obviously your best option is to just be a, a specialist and like that's your highest competitive EV because it's the choice you have, right? Versus hopping back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I'm just talking about nothing else considered, just competitive advantage is all I'm weighing. Um, I think being a special is only useful if you're playing a 50-50 matchup spread. Kind of, kind of not. It really depends. Uh, definitely depends on what you want out of the game for sure. Josh loves Warrior, and that's what makes him happy. 100% agree. 100%. I do think there's good generalists like Brody. Uh, if I, Brody does not focus on Ranger. It's just been the two decks that have been that he, I think he's viewed as being the best. I don't think it has anything to do with Ranger, right? Because Brody's played a lot of Guardian. He used to be really big on Runeblade. It's just the more recent stuff has been Ranger. Uh, but you look at players like Brody, Fang, Hamilton, Charles, Pablo, etc., and they are generally not specialists. That is correct. Um, you are done, Nathan. <laughs> I actually agree that if you're playing at 50% of decks of the format, being a specialist is quite useful. Miss Lexi, yep. Uh, so you're all considering specialists to be a player that exclusively plays one hero? No, I, I mean, one hero or a class, yes, is a specialist. I don't think that if you play four or five heroes, you are what you would think is a specialist. Uh, that's my opinion. And I guess theoretically, if you're putting in 80 hours a week into the game, then theoretically you should have the time allotment to become a specialist in multiple decks. But um, I, I, my definition of specialist, I'm talking like the top of the top. Like you say warrior, and it comes to mind Josh. You say wizard, you got Majin, you got... Peter, you know, like the specialist, right? And, you know, that's not done while playing like 14 other decks. Um, so doesn't it make you a better player overall if you know all the other heroes play line? Yeah, that, that's kind of what I was harping on was you, you... When the hero or class that you quote unquote would have specialized in, specialized in drops off, if you're a generalist, you still get value if you spent some time in X Hero. Uh, I understand your argument, but learning a new class in line also takes time. 100%. 100%. You have to do with what the resources you have can be allotted to. Simple as that. Uh, I do believe that being able to pivot is crazy valuable skill. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good point, Jason. Not everybody... Like this is actually a very interesting conversation that I had with Michael Fang was I thought he was like that player that could like pick up a deck and like just learn it, right? Like I thought no. He he was talking to me one time and he's like I, he said I'm just not that person, right? He's like I'm not that person. And he like just to get a hero down, he said he had to get like hundreds of games in just rep after rep after rep just to get the hero down and i thought that was very interesting because i expected the complete opposite but you're right it's some for some people it's a lot easier some people's a lot harder it just depends um are we roasting you based off your special no uh i i don't like i said i don't think it's bad if somebody's a specialist i don't think it should be looked down on uh but like i 
it's just my opinion that competi- you gain more of a competitive edge being a generalist than you do a specialist. And I think the data would support that. People that do well usually are very flexible. Yep, absolutely. 80 hours a week. I, I, I didn't mean literally 80 hours a week. I was just saying that if you just grind it and grind it and grind it every single day, then maybe you could be a specialist of multiple classes. Um, want Lexi back. Yeah, well, you can't have it. <laughs> you can't have it. Now, I'm both a specialist and a generalist at the same time. Good at every deck. Trust. Yeah, you got it. You got it. <laughs> Knowing the guy, he just plays Tower Shard nonstop on anything he is learning. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, that's, that's the idea. I, it's not bad if you're a specialist. I just think that you get a higher EV by, by, by like, just knowing other classes in and out. Not necessarily in and out, but like knowing more about them, knowing their lines, right? Like I've played some Azalea. So playing against Azalea, I know it's possible, what's not possible, and so forth. My time playing Azalea is not invalid. Whereas at a, when you play your 10,000th Dorinthia game, what did you learn? What did you learn? But, I'm a pivot to Guardian and y'all go flip. <laughs> I'd love to see it, Jason. I know it's not going to happen, but I would love to see it. Um, so that is kind of we we got off on a little bit of a tangent, but that's okay. That's that's I like the the chat engagement. Um, and you guys seem to have liked it too. So uh basically week two, watch out for your fatigue strategies, have a solid game plan. Please, please, please. Play some Prism games. You are, if you walk in there and you play against a Prism and you have no reps, you're going to get dumpstered. I don't care if you have time snap potions, time skippers, lead the charge. It does not matter. You're going to get destroyed if you don't have reps. So please get a couple Prism games in. Find, I know it's hard because the deck's kind of on the up and up. But try to get some reps against a good one. Um, but if if it if it's your local one, then that's perfect because that's who you're going to be playing, and that's perfectly fine, right? Um, in fact, the fact that it's I really like getting local reps in practice for RTN season and ProQuest season because. A strategy might be optimal in a certain matchup, but the way that you know they play it, it could not be, right? I could say, oh, you should, you, you should fatigue this matchup, and then I don't know that the way that person plays it, it that could be just bad advice. You just don't know. Uh, do, do, do. Don't play against prison. No, you should. You should. Uh, Prism is crazy. She's scary good. Absolutely. They legally cannot tell you no. That's exactly what happened to me this weekend. Exactly. I mean, it, it, it is what's going to happen. I promise you. You can have one of the best decks in the room. You will get dumpstered if you don't have the reps. So just get some reps in where you at least know what's happening. You just got to get to that point. If, if you're playing a game and you don't understand what they're trying to do, Play a couple more games. Simple as that. All right, let's go ahead and get into some Viscerai games. Because, like, why not? Because why not? So what's everybody thinking about playing for ProQuest season? Or next week, if you will. Let me know in chat what everybody's thinking about playing. <clears throat> Reinar, we're going to...
I think we're going to risk it and try and go. Actually, I just want to go first, filter. Want to go first, filter, and try and go in. Maybe get a rune chant or two. That'd be cool. We're just going to go with the main package. Okay. No AB. No AB. So you dealt arcane damage this turn. Rune chant. Interesting. I think this line specifically, what we're going to do. Is we're going to make a rune champ. Send the vexing malice. Which is going to guarantee deal three arcane damage, but more importantly, turn on the rattle bones and then we're just going to rattle bones the vexing malice again and play it. Uh, and what this is going to allow us to do is we're going to break the chain, puts it in the graveyard, then we're going to rattle bone because we don't really want this as an arsenal target, right? And we're already getting the arsenal value by dealing two and making one rune chant in the back. So we're going to start them out at 30 four basically and give up our arsenal which i think is fair little unconventional there i understand but i think it's the right play uh coming in hot for nine and he left me with this uh so we can full we can get nine eight value here by blocking this is a yellow, which I think is worth. Or what's the count at? We have attack. We pitch two dreads. So that's three attacks, four attacks, and two non attacks. So we're at a positive one. Maybe no, we can't nine. We can't take nine to to rip the tome. No shot. Okay, so we have played a lot of attack. So we have a couple options here. We can just play the amp. Or the play that I kind of favor is just swing Reaping Blade. The reason for that is it hedges against a all non-attack hand. And also against a Reinar that's running yellow barraging beatdown, I don't think tempo-wise there's a lot of difference between three and six. Woo, this right. Love it. Okay. They roll a one. That's cool, too. Uh, In this situation right here, what we'll do... I mean, this hand kind of sucks. I'm not going to lie. So what we're going to do is we are... This is actually why you run this card. I get this question all the time on... Why do you run... This instead of Spellblade Assault, it's because if you have a brick in your hand, you can always get decent value from it. In this. 
Bold move, Cotton. Oh, the flesh bag on the brick? Rip. I wasn't trying nothing funny. I just had a shit hand. Speaking of shit hands. Okay, he's going for the big turn. That's fine. So, hmm. unfortunately, we don't have the, the ability to Turn off that barraging. I need this drawn. Unfortunately. Because I need a non-attack bad. Like, really bad. <laughs> Did we get one? Oh, man. Okay, so now he just dies. Sure. <sighs> no, 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 no. Okay. So there's actually a lot of interesting lines here. And I think what we got to do is go Mordrin into Swarming, into Swarming. And then we've drawn so many attacks that I'm basically banking on the fact that we are drawing a non-attack. And what we're going to do is try and Creepers it in. Like we're going all in on this, we're going all in on this drawn, like all in on it. And if we miss, we're really sad. Like we've we've seen so many attacks. So what we're going to do is, I'm telling you, this is, this is a high-risk play, but sometimes it's what you got to do. So we're actually going to go ahead and pop the Iron Weave, right? Because we're not going to be able to do it after because we won't have the action point. And then we're going to yeet the drawn, and we're going to rip a non-attack because we're on stream. And we're going to have the two floating for the non-attack that we were about to draw. Okay, technically, I didn't lie. It just doesn't have go again, which means we IP'd ourselves one time. But that's not a bad one to rip and have eight fucking rain chants off of it. Um, yeah. We did rip one, but uh, it was not what I anticipated. Uh, we need to stay out of kill range, and we need to put them into kill range. Okay, we look at the armor situation. There's just one, and it's tunic. So... I think I know what we need to do. We 
we will go here on here. If we would have popped the Iron Weave on the Greedy play, we we could play it all, which would be fantastic because we just creepers it in and then the two pays here, uh, and we're fine. But we have to do it this way, which still gets the hand unless he wants to give us a bajillion rune chance, which that's all we're trying to do is we're just trying to take the hand. Uh, that's all we're trying to accomplish. And because now there is a extremely valid argument on whether you send the shrill or the reaping blade. And I'm, I'm personally going to elect the reaping blade. And the reason for that is I have, I'm really low on attack actions in the deck right now because I've been drawn attack after attack after attack. So I'm going to arsenal this and send reaping blade as anti kind of brick protection right whereas any other situation it's perfectly valid to eat shrill here it's a hundred percent valid uh but in this situation specifically i'm just going to send reaping blade and this is why Okay, Blood Rush Bellow. Ten. Okay. Um, so we have to block two, go to one, and then hope, hope, and hope that this Sonata hits. The Sonata hits, we win. If it misses, we lose. More than likely. Is there any other way? That into Shrill doesn't even get two cards. We can intimidate at one. We have to close the game before he gets reckless. Uh, that's the line we have to take. Bring back Rosetta. Green does not always grant the win. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Play, I like to play Rune Blades because I like to gamble. I mean, you're probably not. Probably not wrong. Uh, okay, so this has to hit. Like, to win the game, it has to hit. And it's very unlikely that it does, but we got there. Okay, so now what we get to do is we get to go... Shrill, and then now this the card that we acquired is our revel, uh, kind of resource, if you will. Does that mean he has reckless? And we get there on the arcane. Okay, let me get caught back up in, in chat. Mauve, Amp, uh, Shrill, all of one blue. Yeah, that's, that's the line we went with. Um, what deck do you think is good against Prism? KO and Dor KO is pretty good. Uh, Dory, not so much. Uh, I take it back. You like to do calculated risk. That is correct. That's the more accurate way. Um, yeah, we had to gamble on the reckless there. Uh, we knew we lose we lose to it, uh, but once again, also we saw the deck composition, right? With like a whole bunch of 
you know, barraging beatdowns. We can assume Rainbow. Um, when we saw Rawhide. So I think he was on like the Pablo list where you have a bunch of D-Reacts. So not only that, but he has to draw Reckless and a six, which I know sounds crazy, but, it, you know, there is a percentage to calculate in there. Um, but I think we played it right. We got we got a little greedy on that one play. It turned out okay. We did rip the non-attack, but um, Bolton, Josh is correct. Bolton, 100% is good into um, into Prism as well. <laughs> Nathan, too good. Ban him. I don't know about that. Better Crawford. Well, not right now because he has the rights to the last name. Uh, that's the the rule that we have is that whoever wins the last match in a, in a in an actual event gets the last name. We've only played once. <laughs> so. Prism pilots are Prism's worst enemy. One of the hardest decks to play in the game. I agree with that statement. Same Ryanar. Um, I mean, it didn't take that long. We'll, we'll, we'll do it again and see what happens. Wow. Um, oh, he brought no rune this time. <laughs> that changes things. There's an argument to play in the Sonata for the extra rune chant in the back and then play read the runes. What I don't want to do, I don't think that one damage value is actually worth giving him a one card filter. That's one thing to keep in mind. So I'm going to elect to just play read the runes, Arsenal the, the Revel, which means I have a high probability to be able to play the Revel because I have arsenaled or have the, the Sonata in hand. Right? However, this is a hand. This is a hand of cards. This does nothing for me. So we're going to do that. I'd love to see a match against Azalea. We'll look for one. If I say Briar was one of my favorite decks in the game, do you think I would likely enjoy this? Depends on how you played Briar. If you were Unga Bunga kind of Briar, then probably not. But if you like to pick your spots, be patient, wait, then yes. And yes, you would. So what we're going to do is, since we have so many non-attacks, we're just going to go ahead and jam out the Mordred. We really need the Sonata to hit. Like, really. Preferably a Swarming Gloomville at that. Or throw a bajillion Rune Flashes. That's cool, too. Um, so what we'll go ahead and do is improvise. Uh, we will go ahead and play the Sonata. Uh, we'll do... X equals six, because I believe it's that or less, right? Yep, or less, so we might as well just pay the full, uh, and we're just going to grab an incantation. No reason to grab the looming. I don't think it really accomplishes anything. And then we're going to draw a ninth blade in the next hand, and we're going to do half his life total in one, one turn. Or not. It is a great hand, though. Into the Blood Rush Bellow. Okay, so we have those Intimidated. We have our blue secured. We have Barraging that we can't do anything about right now. We have so many cards. 14? You're telling me 
You intim you intimidated four cards and did a whole bunch of shit for 14 damage? For 14 damage. You got all worked up for 14 damage. The, the one thing I have to consider is flesh bag. It is a consideration. Which is why we need to play everything up front that we need. And we need to make sure that we need to pitch the vexing malice first because that would okay that's the play that's the play so what we can do We'll pitch the vexing. Okay. And now, no matter what he hits with the flesh bag, we have like a, an acceptable arsenal target, right? Oh, the Sonata was not intimidated. It was just an advantage. Um, what's the criteria to choose the chess piece? Carapace only for Kano. That is correct. Tunic for... Tun yeah. Yeah. You basically got it on nail in the head. Okay. So this is even better. <laughs> this is actually ideal. Because now we have the ability to just play the meet and greet. And he thinks that he's going to have a really good flesh bag here. However, we're just going to pop Iron Weave as our quote unquote resource and uh, swing that way if he decides to. We might just do that anyway, if we're being honest. I think we will, because I don't ha I don't mind having a mob in Arsenal. Not at all. <laughs> Red mob duet, uh, meet and greet, rebel sword. Yep, you called it. That's exactly what I did. Uh, what's your plan into Azalea? Hope they don't dominate. <laughs> That is my plan. Uh, do you think he has to set up a better quad intimidate hand? I think Reinar just has a problem with aggro decks. I don't think it's any way that they're playing or anything like that. Okay.
Okay, so here's what we got to do. We got to take six. Or take four. No shot he has a pummel here. What is this deck? No shot that just happened. Oh, that's going to change things. I guess we're going four into three. My game plan before I had to discard was I was going to throw drawn, pitch vexing, have two floating, draw a random card, doesn't matter what it is, activate creepers, flash in revel, rune flash, sword swing. That was the line, but it got torn apart. I did not expect Pommel coming from Reynor. It's been a minute. It's actually good that he pitched because he is just wasting that because I'm not sending any more arcane. So it's fine with me. The greatest place is Arcane Rising. You're not kidding. You're not kidding. But. He's on a one card hand. We have a great arsenal. Um, oh, man. I want to be, I, I, I'm trying to mathematically find a way to play the ninth blade and it ain't happening, chat. I'm also trying to find a way to play. This is almost the nuts. If this was a blue, it's the nuts. Cost two. Have to pay one for creepers and then pay one. Holy shit, really? I wish it was something more chat, chat, but it's not. If the ninth blade was a blue, we had it. It's the easiest pitch that, or Mordred into that. So much. The fact that he's blocking here is great. Hopefully we can get a flush bag here. I would love it. Okay, this is quickly falling apart. I might have gotten a little greedy in the past couple turns, trying to like force a really big turn. And he has another pummel. 
He has another pummel. Really? Wait, wait, oh no, that was wrong. There we go here, into here. Not sure how we come back on this one. The brick on the sin packing, not entirely sure. Sink glow. Problem is now we just get intimidated because I can't produce lethal damage. Yeah, it's just John Ho's list. Uh, swap cork tone with rattle bones. That's it. <clears throat> okay, two cards, six over here. I guess he's blocking out or sending a swing big, something like that. Maybe a pack hunt makes a little bit more sense. Mark ball. Um. Okay, uh, I don't recommend this, but I think we're in a very losing situation. So what we're going to have to do is play Tome. Uh, so what I'm going to do is literally block this grasp. I'm going to rip Tome, hope it hits. And if it misses, we lose. But it's, I, it's just, the, like, I can't play Become and go get a revel, I don't have a guaranteed go again. I, I guess I could get revel, but then I'll have the blue. I could ditch this, go get revel play. It's, it's still not enough to really pressure. Do I? So if I become, get rid of this, go get revel. Then we play the meet and greet. If he stops the arcane then that'll be four in one, that's five. Revel will be 10 plus three is 13. We're not even close to lethal. And then we're just in the same situation. Whereas if it hits home, I think I can Oh, you're right. I don't even have a Revel left. So we have to go for it. And we miss. Rip. Yeah, but it's like an instant decision when Revel's not there. I forgot that we had to block with one. Played one, blocked one, played the other. Yeah, Wubba Fett, that's John. Yeah, Tome never misses. I played five of them on the PTI event, and not one of them hit. So we're six in a row missing. And then he just has the ability to take this and, and kill us, basically. This is what very likely is going to happen. Unless he has a bunch of like D-reacts or something. I don't know.
There's a situation where you get Red Mauve and swing with the Shrill. Nope, because he still has armor, and it's the same situation. So the only thing that you're changing is the fact that you can swing three after, and that just that does not change the game. Yep, we just died. Seven, we're dead. Okay, let's see if we can find a more interesting matchup. Everybody's on Bolton. Everybody's on Bolton. I'm only on one tome. Well, so tome is part of my anti-fatigue strategy. Why I run three. He's going first. We're going to swap this for this. Have a little bit more aggression. Can he dominate? You know, can throw big ass arrow. There is no way that's right, but I will give you the hand. I mean, this technically is going to block for. Fuck it, let's go. Dang, you fucked up. We're ripping non attack here. We're in good shape. Especially a Revel. Oh, that would be so juicy. That is amazing as well. I think we even pay into it. No, we don't. Because then if we completely whiff, we can't even throw Reaping, which is not where we want to be. In fact, we want to arsenal this card in a perfect world if it doesn't have go again. Or you just get the nuts. That's fine, too. Yoink. Somebody in chat said they want to see the Zaya game. Here it is. Go with in it. That's it. Oh my god. What is happening? That's it.
Mm. The hand kind of sucks at block. But sleep dart is unfortunate. So we have two, two, six, nine. We can go to exactly 11, but we lose creeper. So if we did it, we would just do these two, give the whole hand. But then we're faced with the exact same situation following. I think the only other option is to block here, 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 and here. And then Arsenal the Revel. And we'll just give him the ponder token. It's unfortunate, but. And then basically the next turn time that they don't have a. Um, a really big turn. Then we know what we're doing. There was some merit to pitching. I thought about activating grass before, but the problem is you have the unknown variable of not, like, for instance, if we would have done that and the turn progressed out the way it did, I can't swing Reaping Blade at the end, which means, and they're not pitching for Arcane anyway, so the last mode does not matter because they don't have any blues in their deck. Um I made that decision point a little easier. All right, Red and Ledger Mirror, you dead. Yep. That's not Red and the Ledger. Nice turn. Going to still have to put this in the unplayable tier. Not enough damage after Rosetta ban. Um, I mean, it, it is a nerf not having Rosetta. I, I will admit. But yeah, I mean, he's still doing fine. He's still doing fine. Yeah, uh, that's not going to cut it, Chief. No shot, you just let that hit. I don't care what that hand is. Yeah, I'd concede too. GG. All right, chat. There's your <laughs> there's your Zelly game if that's what you want to call it. Uh no, that was Brody's list. I just I don't know about I mean, you opt into the Spire side. I didn't see if something went down to the bottom. Maybe you took some risky lines and just didn't pay off, which in that deck, I think you have to do those types of things. Um, not entirely sure. What's another game? I don't want to play the SL again. This can high roll, absolutely, absolutely, you can. That is something he does. 
Um, so I'll tell you about an interesting match that I played during the PTI event. I played against. Oh god, this one's gonna take some brain power, chat. This one's gonna take some brain power. Meet and greet out, shuffles out. Okay. Yep. Um so I played I played against Rose, which plays a very like control esque style kind of um dash. And I actually worked the match in a way to where I was able to play Ninth Blade twice in one turn. And it was uh it, it was actually pretty cool. It was pretty cool. So here we definitely have to get rid of the ninth blade. We have it way too early. We don't want to see it again. And then we're going to have to become the rune flash. Going and getting to read the runes. Play the read the runes. And basically what we're trying to do is set up until we get knowledge from the opponent that they're not trying to fatigue us, right? Um, is, is all that we're trying to accomplish here. So they have Golden Sun and a blue, which means Golden Sun's going to go in the arsenal, and they're going to Miller, which is fine. This hand kind of doesn't do anything. So we're just going to leak one. So it is important that we did, uh, we arsenaled a, or we pitched a, um, an attack. What we're going to try and do is we are going to alternate our pitch if the hand allows. Uh, and then when we get down to a small deck size, we'll be able to basically have a, um, an interesting hand. I, this is what I like to do. It, find a hand like this. I'm going to block with a card and I'm going to send the hand like I normally would any other matchup, right? And we're going to see what he does, right? Because right now he's just playing his hands aggressively because he's had tempo the whole game. But I need to see if he's trying to fatigue me or not. So this is the, this is the check, right? Actually, undo. We're blocking with both of these to maintain higher life. Because we can use the tunic counter to swing the sword. So what we're going to do is we're going to send this and see how he responds. That's, that's the only point of this play is to throw it out see how much if he literally gives me a hundred percent tempo and like pitches yellows to stop the rune chance and goes like above and beyond to prevent every single point of damage then we go into turtle mode and we're just trying to build up rune chance and kill him in one go that's the name of the game if he leaks some and like if he blocks with one, maybe two cards, sends a spinal or something like that, okay. Then we're in like this mid rangey kind of game and we just have to play well and wait for big hands. Simple as that. Um, so this de technically does not tell us anything. He could have a bunch of red cards and he's just going to block two cards here. Um, that's not a red card. Um, Okay, then we'll send here. Because using one Revel to get this knowledge, I think is perfectly fine. How does... TR, uh, TR is just for Kano, and I think it's good. 
it basically what it allows you to do is while the rune chants are on the stack and like the rune chants are presenting lethal it gives you spell void simple as that you have to use it very carefully uh because they can always take rune chants down to one and so forth Okay, so he leaked 14 damage on that turn, didn't give me any armor. I don't think he's trying to fatigue me. Okay. Uh, we know the arsenal's a golden sun, so I don't know. What is... Is this a sigil? We're going to block with one of our tomes. I hate doing it. But what we're going to do is we're going to send the Deathling. Make two in the back, which is going to turn this on for next turn. We can go get a, a um, an aura for the following turn. Create that, that extra big turn. We have another tome on top. Holy cow. If we played one, would we have hit is the question. We would have missed. Okay, so we can actually play all of these out, which is kind of cool. Not going to lie. This is just damage. Uh, he did draw an extra card, so this being Pummel, it is possible, but it's also not like guaranteed in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And we also technically have extra cards. So I am perfectly, perfectly fine with just doing... These Sonatas back to back. So I, I like just playing the hand out and taking 10 here. Because what I don't want to do is face the pummel here and then discard down to like the last good card. That is not what I want to do. So we are going to try and avoid that. Which means in this situation, we are going to really I like the idea of having the rune chance in the back. I hate to say it, but I think we have to get rid of swarming. Feels bad. Feels really bad, but you know. What can we do? So what we're gonna do is go ahead and throw out the Sonata. X equals two, which makes it free, which gives it go again. And we go get the Oculate. Wait, it has go again if X equals. What am I missing? Oh, X equals two or high. So I have to pay four. Okay. Hey. 
So then what we're going to do is we're going to do that and then just play this again. And then we'll just arsenal. 100% my fault. Good hand, though. I'll have seven once all of this pops, which is this realistic. We have tunic counter coming up as well. I don't think anything's gaining attack, but we don't really want this arsenal is the main thing. So we are going to go ahead and get rid of that. Since we know we're not in a fatigue match. We're going to get rid of the arsenal. Because we, the reason that we're doing it this way is we want more options for things that we are going to use the become on. If we're going to even use it. We don't even know. We just want, you know, more options. Okay. So we definitely have the ability to... Okay, so I think the line is we're going to go Mauve into Ninth Blade, pitching a blue. That leaves us with one floating. And then what we'll do is we will go Reaping Blade after, and then we'll Tunic Counter, Flash in the Read the Runes, Arsenal become the Art Knight. I think is the, um, the best line available to us. And because we're sending so much Arcane, uh, it's very likely that we'll, we'll keep our Creepers around. Uh, da, da. You already won a pro quest. You attend another pro quest. Nobody knows you already won. You get to the finals. A split is offered where you get the gold foil. Uh, do you tell your opponent you already won one? I mean, that's just like a basic ethics person or situation where. Um, I I would because I the way I think of that is it's kind of like cheesy a little bit. Uh but also if you if you want to think of it from like a smart perspective, right? Your pro quest are your semi locals. And it's not going to be very hard for that person to find out that they, that you have won one already, right? And I I just don't think your locals is a place you want to be like Having those interactions, I, I think it's uh, not ideal. Trounce show a ninth blade one time. We did not. In fact, we did the complete opposite. Okay. Cool. Uh, but he did. He did take the arcane damage, which means we do the another tip. If he was blocking arcane damage, there's an argument to send the read the runes now to keep the creepers, but because he's already taken it, what we're going to do is we're just going to reap and blade now and do it after. But there is validity to doing it the other way around uh, in the situation.
Okay, no go again and discard. That's actually okay. Yep, we'll just send that. Send the arcane to maintain the boots. Uh, we'll take nine down to four. Yeah. Oop. Oop. Jim is putting things to prevent that from happening. From what I read on the new article, yes, to prevent what from happening. They aren't always semi-locals, though. I mean, that's true, but I don't know. I wouldn't, like, look down on somebody for doing it, but me personally, I, I wouldn't. Uh, we're just going to send this because we have no choice because of Spinal Crush. The great thing about us having five room chance is he basically has to commit his turn to, which is another reason why I did not block with creepers, was I want to make sure that I can maintain them. Uh, he's trying to fix his hand, which not yet. Uh, we could be dead next turn, but we'll see. That is interesting, though. I will admit. You tell the person. Because it's, it's obviously not in your interest to do so, but at the same time, I don't know. I've always... I've always been team do the right thing. Because you get, you get paid back in karma. That's just me, though. Okay, so we know there's no possible. One will be floating. We can come into Revel. Go get Revel. So become getting rid of this into Revel. And then we can play this, flash it in, swing repeat. Which means we can block with one attack action. This currently has us taking seven, which we cannot. So we go to one. One more go out of our creepers. We'll block with it on the following turn to cancel out the Millers if I had to guess. Um, so, there's actually a very, very important decision to make here. And that is, do you show them the fact that you have the Revel to get... Right, because we could just play meet and greet, then flash and become, go get the revel, and they don't know it. The problem is you're giving up the one rune chant you make on the meet and greet. I think the damage is more important than the information because we're playing against Victor with a lower blue count than Bravo. So I'm going to go ahead and rip it. But there is some decision making in whether you play it before or after. And if he was in a lower life total, I would hide it. Because it's very likely to just kill him. Uh, but in this, nine's a little out of reach, I think. Uh, so what we're going to do is... Um, also, in this situation, depending on the skill level of the opponent, it does give the illusion that this arcane hitting is extremely important. Um, although we know it's not. Also, to be above board, you definitely should try to split the finals. You should decide the loser gets it.
Yeah, the one thing that I've noticed that in the U.S., anytime you have um, an out of country pro quest, like for Lil, nobody wanted to win the event. They just wanted the gold foil because most of the people were not going. But as far as damage for this turn, we are making, we're sending one, making one in the back. So that's two, four. This is not going to hit. There's no way. So we got two, six, five. That's 11, 14. So we're not ripping the whole hand. It's not our goal. I think the best case scenario here is that he draws one blue and he has to take like all this arcane damage and. That's what we're really counting on is like a low uh, blue count because there is a lot of arcane coming in. We got what? One, two, six. That's eight. Uh, so theoretically, he cannot pitch for any arcane and still like be fine. But if he does that, we can kill him with a Sonata on our turn if he doesn't pitch here. Um, we're really hoping for a one blue hand. Which in Victor happens all the time. And we really, really need him not to have a clash card or not win the clash. Either one I'm fine with. <laughs> okay, so he is pitching for the rune chant and he's blocking. Okay. So he's trying to swing Millers, which we've already decided we're just going to block with our creepers in the next turn, more than likely. Because we have no four blocks. Luckily, we're presenting exactly six rune chants. So if he wants to stop my creepers from breaking, he has to give me three cards, which is out of reach. So we are going to keep the creepers to throw in front of the grindstone if he elects to do that. Um, he could just try to throw something bigger, which is fine. I get it. Um, Yeah, if he has a test or trounce here, yeah, we we just lose. In a hard, I still think we're in a very bad position, uh, but we will see. Okay, so what are we hoping for here? What do we want to accomplish? Um... I think we want to block like that and then just make a rune chant swing reaping blade. And then that actually presents an interesting problem where he's going to have to make the decision to pitch a card, which reduces the threat, or let me keep creepers. Which I don't think creepers is a real threat while I'm at one and he has most of the tempo, but it's just an extra block. So if he ever throws a break point, I'm kind of protected against it. He doesn't have a, um, a gold or any armor, so this also reduces the possibility of a macho because he must give a card here. And we're going to slowly try to windle our way down and hope that he just doesn't have a really good hand. And that's a really good hand. And GG's. Wait, wait, wait. Is there... No, we're one short. If we had Creepers, I was going to say we could block with the attack and then send the Sonata, but even then, we can only dump four into it. And on a perfect split, we only deal two. No. Yeah, it'd be five cards. We can only hit two, and that wouldn't even work. But we don't even have... 
We don't even have creepers, so. GG. But it's always fun to end a game like that. It's, it's always like a really cool way to close it out is using creepers on. Um... That was one of the, the most difficult things as a Bisrop player is a lot of people like I've seen people get attacked into on turn zero and not like block with an attack and flash in like a read the runes like that is just do it you get so much value from the creepers if you do that as long as they don't have a way to punish um you have to be very careful you don't want to take damage to do it because that defeats the whole purpose right but like you do have a lot of lines open to you with creepers where you can um i don't know oh creepers blew up because it had two counters i i completely crossed my mind but yeah i think that's gonna do it for today if you have any more questions about ProQuest coming up this weekend or anything like that throw them in chat right now i'll hang out for another five minutes or so answer any questions you have uh, and if not good luck at your pro quest season i hope you enjoy it i will admit that i'm very cautiously optimistic about the upcoming format and drum i leaving the format i think that there's a lot of things that she was preventing from happening that a lot of people are not going to like not going to like uh and uh we're gonna see if that unfolds um should I play Riptide at ProQuest? Z, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think it's a bad pick. Assuming you're on the aggressive version and not the one with like 13 and a half salvage shots and like trying to fatigue everybody. But if you're on the very, very aggressively leaning one, I think it's a solid pick. Nathan, you recommend any discords for Viscera Specialist or the main Fab Discord good enough? Um, I'm going to be 100% honest with you. Um, right now, it's a rough time looking for a Viscera Specialist because you just had Zach Bunn. I don't think he's completely, le completely left the game, but he said he's not going to be competing like he had before. So there goes a top tier one. Uh, John recently told me that uh, he's doing something similar. Uh, and John, to me, I think is the best viscerai on the planet. Uh, I have thought that for, for two years. I'll scream it from the rooftops. He's taught me a lot of things about the hero. They're just dropping like flies, basically. Um, I have played a lot of reps on the hero. Um, I, I'm a Runeblade specialist. I'll answer any questions that I possibly can. If you're not in the Card Guys Discord, that's the place to find me. Um, the, but, I mean, that's, that, the numbers are dwindling. Uh, I think his channel is Chance and Daggers. I think is 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 uh his channel. I would recommend him if you're looking for the OTK slash turtle burst is what they're calling it. Uh, this list, the one with the shield and the scepter, and the arc like arc knight ascendancy uh, card. If that's what you're looking for, I highly recommend him. He has a YouTube channel. He also spends a lot of time in the purple Discord. Hit him up there. I think his, his, his username is Chance and Daggers, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the PQ I miss weekend will be the second in a row to get shut down for me from life events, and I only have one more to possibly go to this season. I hate to hear that, but, you know, life does come first. That is, that is um, you know, that is life. Uh, do you think that Vincent is a better pick into this upcoming assumed slow metagame than this if you're picking a room blade? It's an interesting question. Um, I think, so there is space in the meta for a control OTK room blade. The math that 
we're going to have to work out is, is OTK Viscera better than set up triple deathly well than set? And which one's more consistent? I think that's what it's going to come down to. Uh, and the answer to that question is that one, right? Um, so it is what I'm going to start trying after ProQuest season. I think my time is better spent doing other things in the game until then because I think Ben Set's strategy is going to highly depend on what comes from this new set, uh, whereas Visrise is kind of like, we know what it's doing. We really know what it's doing. But whichever one is more consistent is going to be my answer. Kill somebody with 30 rune chance with Viserai or set up triple deathly well combo with Vincent. Whichever one's more consistent probably has more, uh, more game into the meta. Want to join us for some Among Us after stream? Maybe. Maybe. What is it? 20, is it 2021 COVID? We're playing Among Us again? What's happening? Chance and Daggers is Turtle Bird special. Yeah, yeah. Cool guy. Cool guy. I'm not giving up on him. I've been on him for two years now. We'll continue until he's gone. Came into the game. Cool. He was the first deck that I truly, truly enjoyed with the combo. Uh, you know, Sonata. I, I played it back. He was what I played during the Starvo era. And being able to flip over 14 cards with with Sonata, I highly just tr just take it to an armory and like obviously you can't play it at the armory, but like find a guy and just play a game and just have a good time. It's one of the funnest things you'll ever do. You flip over 14 cards and like 12 of them are attacks and you only get like two cards. It's it's the most up and down fun thing you'll ever do. I enjoy it. Uh the aggro tips, I think that's the place also. Or aggro tips. Oh, I think that's the place. Yep. Uh, were you on AB3 and TR? Yes, I was. Uh, AB, AB2 on the chess piece, vexing plus TR. That is correct. Hey, Nathan, I saw you and Ed uh, play Tunic Victor recently. Uh, is it a lot better than tech plating? I, so, it is my opinion that 90% of the time, Pummel is a dog shit card if you don't have Tunic, okay? The only time that Pummel is an acceptable card without Tunic is if you run all the four for eights, Chokeslam, Debilitate, and Golden Sun, right? If you run all nine, then it's somewhat acceptable. But if you're really holding a whole nother card to play a pummel, you're not actually realizing the value because one, you're telling your opponent about it, and two, you're just not getting the same value. Like CNC pummel is not cool when you're using four cards to do it. It just isn't. It's not as good. Um, so... That's my whole... Now, if you're not on a bunch of pummels and you're doing like a slower, grindy, more D-React, sure, play Tectonic. It makes sense. What made you decide on Yellow Pummel in Victor? That's the real question. It was the only edge that we could find against Stromai, KO, and also it helped us keep on the gas against Kano. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have been keeping up, but I've actually had a pretty good record into Kano on Victor recently. I beat Majin at the PT, and uh, I took one of two down at the Battle Harden. Uh, and usually that's that's like a 5 percenter, right? And some of it was variance. I was running a little bit hot at the PT against Majin. Um, but... I think having out muscles and extra pummels definitely, definitely help. What, uh, I don't know what's better. Flip 14 cards or create extra room chance. Discard their hand. Was Yeah, I mean, both of them are great. Did Majin throw? No, he did not throw. 
uh, I just had go again attack every single turn and put him in a position where he had to go and he went and it was enough damage. Simple as that. There was no mistake in the game. It was just it, the deck produ produced enough. Like the reason that Palm was so good in the Kano specifically is they always block down and keep like an e-pot. So if you pummel over the attack and it hits, you take their e-pot, and that like goes against everything that they're trying to do. Uh, so it's like really, really good. But looks like the questions have kind of dried up in chat, so I'm going to thank all of you for joining me. I really, really do appreciate it. Thank you for coming out. And uh, good luck at your ProQuest this weekend. I have one myself. I'll be in Huntsville, Alabama at Magnolia Gaming uh, for their event. If you're there, I'll see you there. And good luck at your event. Take care, everybody.